Hey everyone, welcome back to our discussion on switches and switch mode power supplies. Today we're talking about diodes. So I'm, I'm going to try and, you know, give you like the broad strokes of diodes and switch mode power supplies. Last time we were talking about stress, we were talking about utilization and analyzing converters to determine what the ideal switches and those converters needed to do in order for the circuit to operate properly. So now we're going to look at a specific kind of device, and that device is the diode. So what is the diode? The diode is a PN junction. I mean, that's kind of how you first learn about it, right? It is literally the junction of some P-type silicon and some N-type silicon, generally. This is kind of like the, the first level of diodes, right? And at this junction, so there are some positive mobile charge carriers in the P-type and there's some negative charge carriers in the N-type. And at this junction, what tends to happen is that these mobile charge carriers tend to drift around and, and combine. And when they combine, they kind of like cancel out each other's charge. And what they leave behind is some fixed charge, right, in, in, in the semiconductor. So in the P-type, when the positive charge is removed, what's left is some negative charge. And in the N-type, when the negative charge is removed, what's left over is some positive charge, right? So we have this region between at this junction where we've depleted the charge carriers in that region. And for that reason, we call this the depletion region. Right, and this depletion region kind of determines the characteristics of the diode, right? So this is the thing that you have to overcome to turn it on, and it's the thing that blocks uh, current from flowing in the opposite direction. So we'll, we'll just kind of go to circuit level from here. So the way we draw a diode is like this, right? There's a triangle with a line, right? On this side, we have the cathode, and on this side, we have the anode, right? So positive current comes out of the cathode, and we can imagine that we can apply some voltage across this device, VD, and there's some current through this device. And I'm not, we're not going to go over the equation specifically of ID versus VD. But uh, what we can do is think about what happens, what we need to do to turn this device on and off, right? This is, usually we think of it like a valve. So how does it operate? Well, broadly, there are two, there are two distinct regions that we that we think of in switch mode power supplies. There are obviously other ones, but two main ones are the forward biased region, right? And this is when VD is greater than some threshold voltage, right? So we usually have to exceed some voltage. In this case, I'm calling it the forward voltage drop, VF. The voltage you apply to the diode has to be greater than VF to turn the diode on, right? And when this happens, positive current can flow through the diode. Uh, ID is positive. Right? So when this happens, when we do this, when the diode is in a forward biased state, we on a circuit level, we draw it as a voltage source, right? So when we turn it on, we have to, there's some positive voltage across this diode, VF, that we have had to overcome. In other words, we kind of lose this voltage when, when it's turned on, right? There's a voltage drop across the diode, VF. Cool. The other region is the reverse biased region. This is when VD is less than, less than zero, let's say, when it's negative. When we apply negative voltage, to a diode, we're reverse biased. ID is zero, or tends towards zero is maybe a better way of saying it, it's not exactly zero. There's some leakage current and stuff. But when we apply a negative voltage to a diode, it does not it does not conduct, and it looks like an open circuit generally. So for this reason, I mean, we can we can imagine, we can think about the, the IV curve, or the IV characteristics of a diode, right? I mean, in, in this way I've described here, right? What this diode can do is it can block negative voltages, right? So when you reverse bias it, it looks like an open circuit, it blocks negative voltages. And when you forward bias it, it conducts positive currents, right? So a diode cannot conduct negative currents typically. I mean, if you do, you're probably breaking it. 
and it cannot block positive voltages, right? If you apply a positive voltage, you're just going to turn on. So for this reason, the diode is, we call it a one quadrant device. So anytime you see uh, an ideal switch in a switch one power supply that requires either to conduct positive current and block negative voltage, or to conduct negative current and block positive voltage, right? The, the alternative is, is this quadrant. Then you can stick a diode there, right? The diodes would be effective in that situation. They're uncontrolled, right? They just operate naturally. So if you need control for that device, then you couldn't use a diode. But if you don't need to control it, then, then a diode would work in that case. So one quadrant device, which conducts positive current, and blocks negative voltage. Cool. So this is like the circuit level thing, the circuit level characteristics, right? What a diode, forward bias, reverse bias, whatever. But we're also interested in some more details when it comes to diodes. One, how big is VF? Right, this is related to conduction losses. So if VF is large, we can think of the loss across this element. If we if we apply some current through this diode, then ID times VF is loss, right? This current is going to the positive terminal. We if, I, if VF is big, then the loss will tend to be larger for the same current. So typically, we want diodes with a low forward voltage drop. Two, we're also interested in the blocking voltage. So in order to block higher potentials, typically you have to make the device bigger in some way or use a different kind of uh, insulator or something, different kind of semiconductor structure in order to achieve higher blocking voltage. So typically higher blocking voltages make the device, let's say, slower. And lossier, right? So maybe maybe there's more resistance, or there's VF will increase if you want to have a higher blocking voltage switch. So it's kind of a requirement of the circuit, right? If you if you're trying to convert 1,000 volts into 500 volts and you need a diode, you're going to need to block something around a thousand volts, right? So it's kind of required by the circuit. But we're also like interested in how we construct them to achieve these these blocking voltages but this is usually specified in data sheets. Another thing we're interested in is how much current can it conduct. Right, so if, if you want to conduct, let's say a thousand amps through a diode, well, that diode is gonna be pretty big to, to be able to carry that current. If it was like a tiny diode trying to conduct a thousand amps, it would just burn up. So. How much current conduct it, can, it conducts affects the construction of the diode itself. Another thing we're interested in is how quickly can it turn off? And this is a very important aspect of diodes. So diodes exhibit a phenomenon called reverse recovery. And there are other phenomena you can think about with diodes, but a primary one that people are interested in is reverse recovery. So what is it? Well, basically, when we forward bias a diode, what we're doing is we're modulating this depletion region by injecting charge into the semiconductor, right? So we're kind of reintroducing mobile charge carriers and decreasing the depletion region when we're forward biasing it. When we turn it off, we have to remove that charge that we had put in to turn it on. Right, and that takes time. Removing that charge takes time. So, looking at this as a function of time, right? We can kind of, I can show you what this would look like as a function of time if we plot ID. If you imagine that the current was, or the diode was conducting some current I, and at some point in time, something else in the, in the circuit changes that results in the diode current to decrease. When it reaches zero, it's not yet off. So, just to highlight that. At this point, even though it's conducting zero current, it's not off yet. Unfortunately, if it were, that would, that would be great. But for hard switching converters, 
or hard switch and converter applications, it's not yet off. So what happens is that we have to inject some charge, right? We have to, or we have to remove the charge from the de from the depletion region, from the junction that we had in, that we had injected when we turned it on. So to do that, we have to apply some negative current, right? And eventually that current drops to zero again when we completely turn it off. But there's this region of negative charge that we're injecting into the diode, right? So you can imagine that that's actually going into the cathode of the diode, this reverse recovery charge. And this length of time is called the reverse recovery time, TRR. So if it takes a long time to do this, if, it, if TRR is big, then you have to wait for TRR to elapse before you can turn the diode on again, right? If you don't wait for this to happen, if you don't wait for the diode to turn off completely before you turn it on, then it was never really off in the first place, right? It's kind of just been on the whole time. So if you want to use this as a switch where it turns off and on rapidly, then TRR has to be short, right? We want, or rather, we want TRR to be short in high frequency applications for switch mode power supplies, right? And what's more, if TRR is large or the charge, right, QRR, this integral of current over time, if QRR is large, this is just wasted energy. This energy is lost, right? It does no useful work. It's part of the loss of the converter. If we switch fast and we have a large QRR, then we're wasting a lot of energy, right? And if we try to switch faster with a large QRR, then eventually that heat will build up and cause the device to fail. So if we want to use diodes in high switching switching frequency applications, we need to choose diodes which have short TRRs, right? We want to reduce switching loss as much as possible. So how quickly can it turn off reverse recovery? This is related to switching loss and speed in, in a sense. Cool. So people have done a lot of things to, f to figure this out. And the two main flavors of diodes that I'm going to look at today are fast recovery diodes and also another type of diode called the Schottky diode. So let's for, first look at fast recovery. There's, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of fast recovery diodes. Sometimes there's ultra fast or they specify how quickly they can turn off, basically. So fast recovery diodes are built fundamentally differently than uh, than the conventional diode here, right? This is just a junction of PNN. Fast recovery diodes, people have discovered a way to improve the characteristics of diodes, basically. And they do that. My understanding is that the that there is some kind of, there's still a junction, right? It's still semiconductors, right? So there's some P-type then they introduce some kind of lightly doped region. And then, or and they call it an epitaxial region. And there's an epitaxial wafer. I'll, I'll throw a link to, uh, to a PDF describing these kinds of devices. And then there's a, a heavily doped N region, right? This is kind of the classical thing. And what they also do is they uh, they they dope the silicon with like gold or platinum, and this accelerates recombination of the uh, of the charge carriers, which kind of allows the depletion region to recover to its original state. This epitaxial region kind of allows you to control the blocking voltage and also introduces a region where there aren't as many mobile charge carriers, so there you don't have to put as much charge into it, let's say, to, to forward bias it. The details are quite complicated, but this is just to say fast recovery diodes have a physically different uh, implementation, and the way they're designed enables the TRR to be decreased. So they use this structure to create diodes with high blocking voltages. That's one reason. Or they're able to create diodes with very high blocking voltages. But 
they don't sacrifice VF, right? VF doesn't become very large. And TRR doesn't become super large. Right, so it's it's kind of a way to make a like a, a high voltage diode that doesn't that isn't really slow and really lossy. So that that's basically the point. So fast recovery diodes are typically used for higher voltage applications. Like kilovolts, they they can go pretty high, and uh, relatively lower switching frequencies. So they can switch quickly. TRR is not too large, but it's still not super small. Like this, this wouldn't be suitable for like megahertz applications. That that would probably be too fast. But tens to hundreds of kilohertz, this would probably be suitable. Really, it, it depends on the application. Cool. So the other type, the other flavor of of diode that I want to talk about is the Schocke diode, and this is again a different kind of construction. Instead of a PN junction. It's actually a metal semiconductor junction, and typically that metal is aluminum, although I'm sure that there are other kinds of constructions. So it's typically aluminum and N-type. And this different junction has a different depletion region, right? Or like the depletion region is only in the N-type, basically. The result is very low forward voltage drop. Um, but it has, it has a drawback of lower blocking voltages. Right, th this junction, you can kind of tell, right? Like this junction, it, this is a conductor, right? It can't really block anything. You can't modulate the, you can't dope it in a different way, or maybe you could, but it's not a semiconductor, right? You can't like change the state of this thing to make it block voltages. Whereas over here, you can control the blocking voltage but kind of by controlling the length of this epitaxial region, right? So this isn't really able to do higher blocking voltages, but it is able to switch much faster, very low TRR, right? So this thing, this device can turn off much quicker, which means you can switch it much, much faster and it has a much lower loss with switching at high frequencies. So this is really kind of lower voltage applications. but very high switching frequencies, very high. You could go up, I don't want to quote a number, but yeah, maybe hundreds of kilohertz, maybe up to a megahertz or something, but maybe you'd need a kind of different design, higher frequency. Right, at least compared to this, right? So so it kind of, the, the less than or equal to two signs kind of go this way. So the voltage is lower, but the frequency is higher. And these are used, all the time, right? They're still making fast recovery diodes or ultra fast diodes, and still making shocky diodes. They're they're uh, they're used quite often. So let's. I wanted to look at a few uh, a few actual applications or a few data sheets specifically. And I'm not associated with either of these companies. So this is Vijay, one a huge manufacturing company, and this is Nexperia, and they they also do a lot of uh, manufacturing, but. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to look at a few, like an example of an ultra fast diode or a fast recovery diode and a shocky diode. So over here, so this is a fast recovery or ultra fast recovery. And what do they specify? Well, they tell you the maximum voltage you can block. So they have a few different devices here going from 50 volts up to 1000 volts. So pretty high blocking voltage. I didn't choose like the highest blocking voltage switch per se. The package is actually quite small. This is, uh, yeah, it's quite small. They tell you the diagram, what, you know, cathode and anode or whatever. They tell you the maximum forward, forward current that it can rectify, right? How, that it can pass. And in this case, it's one amp. They also tell you power peak forward surge current, 8.3 milliseconds, single half sine wave superimposed on the rate of load. So what, what does that mean? That seems kind of complicated. Well, let's just draw it out. What is a single half sine at 8.3 milliseconds look like? So 
half sine 8.3 milliseconds. If we complete the cycle, that must mean that this is 16.6 milliseconds, which means this is a 60 hertz, if I'm not mistaken, this is a 60 hertz sine wave, right? So what this is saying is you could use this in applications where you're connected to an outlet, right? And maybe some kind of surge happens, something breaks. This diode can withstand 30 amps of this half sign pushed through it. Might be good information if you were doing a converter for that kind of application. Okay, what else do they tell you? Well, they tell you the, the forward voltage drop, right? Maximum instantaneous forward voltage at a rated current. So that they're, they're doing it at one amp. And for the lower voltage devices, the forward voltage is one volt. And as you get to the higher voltage devices, the construction varies, right? So the forward voltage drop also varies. It goes up to 1.7 volts. So the maximum DC reverse current, so this is like leakage current, the current that might flow backwards through this diode, right? So they're quoting 10 to 50 microamps, right? So at, and this increases with temperature, right? So for lower temperatures, maybe there'd be 10 microamps leakage current, and for higher temperatures, it goes up to 50. So for power applications, wait, if you're conducting one amp at a time, 50 microamps probably isn't so much, probably not that big a deal, but it's still good to know for different applications, maybe this is important to think about. Maybe 50 microamps flowing backwards through your diode is not good, and you have to pay attention. They also give you the maximum reverse recovery time, right? So this is like how long it takes for the diode to turn off. So again, this varies based on the voltage rating of the diode. So for lower voltage, it can turn off faster, right? 50 nanoseconds for reverse recovery time. And for higher voltage, 75 nanoseconds, right? So that kind of makes sense because there is physically a large, for the higher blocking voltage, there's like a larger area. So there's probably more, more charge that needs to be recycled through or put back into the device in order to turn it off. So it's a bit it's a bit larger for higher voltage switches. And they also give you some junction capacitance. So this is the junction, like the junction between the two semiconductors. And the capacitance they're quoting here is 15 to 10 picofarad. So why does it decrease with increasing voltage? Well, if what we're saying is true and higher blocking voltages need physically larger devices, longer devices to block higher voltage, then if you think about this parallel plate capacitor, right, you have two nodes over here or two plates on either side. If the distance between them gets larger, then the capacitance should go down, right? So for the higher blocking voltage, there's more separation in the junction, right? The epitaxial layer might be larger. And as a result, the junction capacitance decreases, right? So Junction capacitance might not be important for your particular application, but for other applications, it may be, right? This, this is still good information to have. Cool. So to compare, we'll look at the Schottky diode. So if you remember, we said that we said that the fast recovery is more for high voltage, lower frequency applications, and the shock key was for lower voltage, higher frequency applications. Well, here we're looking at a 20 volt switch, a 20 volt diode, right? And two amps, kind of close to one amp. I, I just kind of chose randomly, to be honest. Well, here they give you an average four current, two amps, uh, a reverse voltage, how much voltage it can block, 20 volts. And they also give you the forward voltage, right? So the forward voltage drop of this Schottky diode is 395 millivolts. So that, that's like, even compared to the lower voltage uh, fast recovery diodes, right, ultra fast rectifier diode, it's still like 40% of the forward voltage drop, right? So if you're looking for low voltage applications, this is going to have much lower conduction loss than this switch, right? And that's because of the way it's constructed, right? So again, this typically has lower forward voltage drop. That's the way it's designed. They also give you some reverse recovery current, right? So in this case, it's larger, right? 70 microamps compared to say 10 to 50 microamps. And it's larger because again, the jun one of the junctions in the Schottky diode is, is metal, right? It's not semiconductor. It's not, the metal can't really block anything. It's just a conductor. So the reverse current being a bit larger kind of also makes sense. And then we look at the reverse recovery time, right? And it is significantly smaller, right? Even for the lower voltage 
diodes over here, it's still 50 nanoseconds. For the Schottky diode, it's 10, it's 5 nanoseconds, right? 10 times faster than the ultra-fast recovery or the ultra-fast rectifier. All right, so again, this kind of just highlights. What I wanted to highlight was this is for higher frequency, lower voltage. This is for higher voltage, lower frequency. So that's really all I wanted to, to discuss with you, right? So basically we went over diodes being one quadrant switches. We're interested in the forward voltage drop. We're interested in the TRR. We're interested in the V block. And we're interested in the uh, in the forward in the forward current that it can conduct. Right. This is what I wanted to talk about. Hopefully, I did it well enough. And next, we're going to talk about MOSFETs. Thanks.